thank you so much for that, Charlotte. I'm really glad you went first because you've set me up beautifully. You've explained so much that I now don't need to explain. Um, okay, so my second MSc was actually part of my PhD fellowship, and it was in quality and safety in healthcare. And I've managed to um, publish an awful lot from that MSc, so I'm really glad I did it. Um, and I'm the only fellow in my cohort that actually took on that MSc, so everyone else is kind of finalising now, and I've got another year to go. But I'm so glad I did because it's really it's pushed me in the direction that I I now need to go in for the rest of my my career. So. I'm going to present to you the work that underpins my PhD, and this is the dissertation work from my MSc in Quality and Safety in Healthcare. These are two of the papers that I had published from this work. Um, there are more, but I decided not to show off too much. Cute, really busy slide. This is a little bit of a worrying slide, but I'll, I'll give you the context for it. So because my clinical background is maternity services, I developed this timeline of key moments in English maternity services, healthcare safety history, really since 1993, which was the year that Changing Childbirth was published. And coincidentally, that's actually the year that I commenced my nurse training with Project 2000. And we can see that this illustrates a plethora of policy interventions for service improvements, really since 2017, where I've had to expand my timeline. And that's in the aftermath of revelations from the Francis Report, the Freedom to Speak Up Report, the Kirkup Report. Then we've got Cumberledge and we end up with the Ockenden Report. We know the history. So my timeline demonstrates the current focus on quality and safety within maternity services in England, and it evidences the timeliness of my research. So from 2017, the UK government intervened, removing midwifery self-regulation in response to the Kirkup report, which was Morecambe Bay, as we all know, and again intervening in September 2020 with the opening of the public inquiry into maternity services safety. And this has culminated in significant funding pledges for maternity services and the acknowledgement of a need to improve leadership. Incidentally, Buchan estimates a global shortage of almost 6 million nurses and the International Confederation of Midwives estimates a shortage of 900,000 midwives globally. And within England, we've got estimates between two and a half and 3,000 midwives necessary just to run a safe service. So we need to create a system in which quality and safety aren't sacrificed. And I firmly believe that the people closest to that system are the ones best placed to improve it, which echoes what Charlotte was saying earlier. So Deming said that a system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. There is a reason why 70% of claims against the NHS resolution are coming from maternity services, alongside 47% of payouts, and that will probably be more now thanks to the Ockenden report. So we're experiencing horrifying attrition rates for maternity professions. The staff experience and the patient experience are intrinsically linked. So within the work that I'm about to show you, power is defined as the ability to control people and events, and hierarchy is described as a system in which people or things are arranged according to their importance. This work was carried out during the summer of 2020 when we had restrictions on research ethics for MSc students. So I had to do a narrative synthesis rather than primary research. And I pulled together 10 research papers over the previous 20 years with the views of 173 maternity staff. Participants ranged from midwives, maternity support workers and student midwives and came from countries, including the countries of the UK, Australia and New Zealand. And each of the papers that I reviewed considered a strong need for improved education on the topic of staff well-being and a recognition of the urgent need to challenge a culture which so directly affects the safety within healthcare. So some of you will recognise this is the double helix um, DNA and these were the themes that I pulled out from this particular narrative synthesis and the worry is, is this the DNA of maternity services? I'm going to share some of my findings in context, and then we will flip the idea of this being the DNA of our service right on its head. Exploration of dangerous workloads. I love being a midwife, but I'm exhausted, and what we do is never good enough. Management support is non-existing. We have employed so many junior midwives to replace those who've retired or left the profession burned out. So as an experienced midwife, you are hammered with high-risk patients, expected to support the junior midwives and mentor the students, and then our organisation wonders why we are so exhausted. There is a terrible, deeply ingrained, long-standing culture of bullying based on outdated ideas about hierarchy and bad managers who had no real management training. Women and their families experience bad care from small-minded individuals who bully and are bullied. It's awful. 
And so I pulled themes about anxiety about the job, fear of investigation, futility of speaking out, feeling powerless and burnout, stress and anxiety. I give guest lectures around the country and I use Participol for online teaching so that students can feel a sense of ownership. And this particular slide is from a cohort of students who were about to qualify. And as you can see, there was an overwhelming agreement that they'd experienced these problems just as they were about to qualify. Student, would I go to Matron if I had a problem? She'd be the last person I'd go to, that's for sure. No, I certainly wouldn't go to Matron, no. I'd be highlighting myself. I'd probably just be earmarked for something else again. No, I wouldn't. And she would yell at you, publicly humiliate you in front of the whole ward. And when you started crying, she would pull you into hugs and become very emotionally manipulative. So this public humiliation perhaps showed how the power implicit within hierarchy is operationalized. I would be physically sick before entering a placement. And despite constantly reporting to management that our staffing levels are so poor, it is making it an unsafe environment for staff and service users. Nothing is done to help. They will never close the unit despite the safety issues. And when something does happen, it's the midwives who end up being investigated, despite our continual concerns being voiced. And Hunter and Warren wrote of tensions arising from the juxtaposition of professional autonomy with institutional policies and protocols. And this is something that I pick up within my PhD, is the staff experience compared to our policies and to our reports. And this resonates with the sense of powerlessness that participants all felt. It highlights the significance of risk and uncertainty in the nature of midwifery work that we will all recognise. 18% uh, of participants in an RCM Caring For You campaign admitted to crying often at work because of their work-related pressures. And I'm certain because of COVID that that figure will be far higher now. And staff spoke of feeling haunted by the longer term consequences of adverse events and a fear of future litigation if the babies involved had not thrived. And we will all recognise that. I looked at the psychological vulnerability, and this is really cultural normalization of dysfunctional relationships, the stuff that we end up taking for granted, like we just put up with it. So the bullying, the subordination, the rigid organization system and that workplace atmosphere. So bullying was cited by maternity staff in every single paper research for this narrative and hierarchical language showed staff fearing that they were little fish about to be fried or that Great fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them and little fleas have lesser fleas and so ad infinitum. This is hierarchical language coming through. This infers that the act of bullying is a learned behaviour, perhaps in a process of initiation into the profession. She, the mentor, is the bully of the unit and other staff join in to avoid being the next victim. The abusive use of hierarchical power within dysfunctional relationships was best described in the following quotation. Incompetent senior management, morally questionable leadership, disability discrimination, punitive health and well-being policies, knee-jerk reactions to mistakes, a lack of information about re resolutions, a bullying culture and a lack of team spirit. I looked at working conditions, that poor organisational and structural conditions, so the lack of breaks, the dangerous workloads and that inflexibility that we are all so familiar with. And again, this was from a cohort of students about to qualify. Look at how many of them had experienced lack of breaks, dangerous workloads and inflexibility. It's all there. There's quite a delay sometimes in getting help or knowing how to get help. That's been apparent from a few incidents that we've had over the last year. But although... We feel that we've got a clear pathway to protect staff and other patients and other users. In reality, it doesn't always work out that way. And it's pretty much at the mercy of whichever security guard is on or whichever manager is covering or whatever. And I definitely re-explore that within my PhD. With the responsibility, lack of support, low pay and fear of constant litigation, not a chance. Every shift is so dangerously understaffed that midwives will risk their NMC pin just to turn up for work. The caseloads are ridiculous and never did we get a proper break. So dangerous. And that's a midwife that left. The inflexibility. If a more common sense approach to staffing were taken, there are vast numbers of midwives in exactly the same position, all trying to juggle young families. If only we were allowed to work fewer hours, we'd all stay and staffing would be better. Another midwife that's left. 
I looked at the institutional normalization of the dysfunctional relationship. So the exhaustion, the low morale, the poor communication and that poor staff engagement. Several papers pointed out that dysfunctional relationships occurred on labor wards specifically, such that some would avoid returning to that environment because they were expressing deep concern about working there. And this suggests that the abuses of both power and hierarchy are feeding into a system so much so that it's become commonplace institutional behavior, with staff left unsupported and yet still held accountable, threatening their safety on a professional register. And Linda voiced her belief that midwives are so mean to one another because everyone is absolutely exhausted. And that that exhaustion, that time is a really key component of my PhD. So who is going to get their heads on the chopping block for it? You know, you do know you might have to go to court over it. You might have to go to court, don't you? I was baffled by this, this change gone from the sadness then to the fear. It was very surreal. And that was, wow, such a moment for me. And I thought, do I want to be in this profession where clearly this should be all about the parents now and supporting the midwife and the staff who were in there? Worst decision I made was applying for midwifery. I wish I'd looked into this more, but I know that it's not the end of the world and that I was part of something beautiful with those families. And I will forever treasure this, but I can't carry on like this. The disgusting behaviour witnessed and experienced on placement makes me embarrassed to be a part of this profession. Another midwife lost. Poor communication. The matron was there. It's been a bit of a bad night, she said. I've heard all about it and I don't want to hear any more. And I thought, well, you know, that's great. I've heard all about it. I don't want to hear any more. And I said, OK, and sounds upset. Obviously, this midwife I was working with was in floods of tears and I was expected to be OK. And off I went and she went on sick and I never did see her again. Another lost midwife. So the disconfirmation findings are how we know that this bleak picture is not written into the DNA of maternity services. These findings are what give us all hope that the system can change. We can know that there are opportunities for us to thrive as a community of practice. Labour Ward is fabulous since the new superintendent came. She's excellent. She's just uplifted the place. She is just such a bonus around the place. She's somebody that you can go to and talk to and say, look, this happened and that happened. And she'll actually sort it out. Another band seven came out and she took me into the clinical room and she shut the door. And she gave me a hug. And this wasn't your most touchy feely band seven generally. And she said, if my daughter was going to deliver here, I would be so happy if you were looking after her. And that kind of well, it made all the difference. I was very inexperienced and obviously quite distressed. And it made that made a huge difference. And I felt it gave me the puff of wind I needed to go back in and carry on with my responsibilities. And kindness. After the neonatal death I was involved in, we had the police in, statements and God knows what. Your whole practice is questioned and it was an awful thing. There was no mechanism for debriefing, just waiting for the postmortems, which took about three weeks. And that was an awful, awful, awful thing. And one of the obstetricians got me through. He said that in this profession, not everyone is going to make it and none of us are God. I want to become a team leader so I can become in charge and make sure that new students aren't treated in the same way. So I looked at the NHS constitution and compared this to all of these experiences. We have a right to a working environment with flexible working opportunities. We have a right to a working environment that is healthy and safe and free from harassment, bullying and violence. We have a right to be treated fairly, equally and free from discrimination. There is a pledge to provide a positive working environment, promoting supportive, open cultures that help staff to do their jobs, to do the best of their ability, to raise concerns with employers, whether it's about safety, malpractice or other risks in the public interest. And gaslighting. This is the action of tricking or controlling someone by making them believe that things aren't true. And gaslighting is actually a form of psychological abuse. So. 
The implications for healthcare by addressing the negative elements of power and hierarchy within maternity services, by providing an environment where staff are personally safe to voice their concerns without dysfunctional professional and personal redress, and a leadership acknowledgement of our human fallibility rather than complacency, blame and misplaced brand loyalty, we may be able to mitigate for the inherent risks which lead to harm for both patients and staff within our healthcare services. And I have to mention my funders, the Healthcare Improvement Studies Institute, because they created seven features of safety and maternity units. And this is brilliant because it's everything that we need to make the systems work. It's about commitment to safety with all levels of staff involved. It's about technical competence and training. And the lack of training is coming, really coming through in my PhD research. Teamwork and cooperation positive working relationships, constant reinforcing of safe, ethical and respectful behaviours, which is what Charlotte was talking about, multiple problem solving sensing systems, systems and processes designed for safety and regularly reviewed and optimised, and that is my PhD, and effective coordination and the ability to mobilise quickly. So when Charlotte and I met at the conference earlier this year with our adjacent PhD posters, we realised that we had so much in common. There are strong grounds for collaboration. My PhD takes this original narrative synthesis as a step further by exploring employee voice in experiences of asking for help. A PhD needs to be unique and mine is interdisciplinary. I take business and social science ideas and I'm reviewing staff narratives of escalating care, researching the staff experience of navigating the digitization of escalation visual management tools, sort of like early warning scores, sepsis and SBARs. This has been a brilliant way to explore further the working culture of maternity services across England. James Reason said, we cannot change the human condition, but we can change the conditions under which humans work. And Donna Bedian said that we need to consider systems, processes and outcomes. So I've been taking a look at real staff voices. I've been lucky enough to interview my people, successfully recruited through social media. I've interviewed 55 members of staff from across England, and these have been broadly representative of the multidisciplinary team. It's clear from my research that different staff groups have very definite visual needs for the future of digitization. For doctors, these needs are very much rooted in, just tell me what you need from me. Managers want tools to tell me what you did, where, when, and how, and their world is one invaded by audits and reputations. Senior staff have said, trust my judgment, I'm always accountable, but I have limited time to care. And this staff group are being squeezed in every direction and crushed under the weight of duplication. Junior staff have very clearly said, teach me, guide me, support me, I'm frightened. And this staff group are responsible for taking the patient observations underpinning escalation, but they do not necessarily have the training or the knowledge to support the roles that they hold. So my coding has grouped these findings into human factors of comprehension and motivation and the intangible and tangibles of ergonomics. There isn't time within this presentation to fully explain my findings, but this slide displays a summary of my priori conceptual model to be applied to my own empirical research findings within my PhD. And this is what I plan to present to you when we go back to Birmingham um, next year. So here are my contact details, which will be available on the slides. And I give you an awful lot of references because oh. anyone, anyone <laughs> that works with me knows. <laughs> All of my colleagues have been saying, oh, God, it's Helen. <laughs> This is what I do is I share my references. All right. Thank you so much. Uh -huh.